uh, for Black History Month, a lot of people have always asked me, how in the world did you ever get to Modesto? Modesto. I, I never heard of Modesto, really. I went to uh, school in New York City, so that's another story. But I want to take you back to my early beginnings. And in 1939, when I was born, oops, I forgot, I told my age. 1939, when I was born, it was in the World War II. And uh, I grew up knowing who my family was, but also knowing who my greater family was in terms of my grandparents. I want to take you back a little bit to segregation. I grew up in 1939, and in 39, uh, segregation was the law of the land. Um, we didn't have George Wallace as the governor, but many of the governors echoed his remark that was segregation now, segregation forever. So that was the whole gloom over the South during the time that I was born and until I really left. But let me take you back a little bit further than that. My great-grandmother was born on a plantation. Uh, she was born in uh, 1865 or right thereafter uh, uh, when Lincoln uh, freed the slaves. She was born on the Bla uh, uh, Bowen Plantation to a family whose a brother or somebody uh, had raped her, uh, was had bought her or whatever, her mother, and therefore she was born uh, out of wedlock or she was born as a mulatto, so to speak. So in 1865 and thereafter, we found out later that she was an adored child because she was part of the family, really. Her, the, old, the brother uh, of, of the, the main uh, slave owner had uh, fathered her and so therefore she was kind of like a favorite child. She was very fair, had beautiful hair and so uh, later years we learned that they would take her up to the big house so to speak and, and play with her as a baby because she was so beautiful. So after, after uh, when sl the slaves were uh, freed in 1865 and many years thereafter, my great-grandmother uh, married a guy named Jackson Bowen. He must have been on the same plantation because his name was Jackson Bowen. So they married, and after they uh, were freed, they moved to around Easley, South Carolina, I think, which is in Pickens County, uh, South Carolina. And in Pickens County, South Carolina, uh, now, segregation is still the law of the land, very segregated, a very lynch uh, mo uh, motto town. Uh, they, they raised nine children, I believe. My grandmother was one of the children. My grandmother and my aunt was also very fair. They stayed around that part of the South. They stayed near uh, Easley. But the rest of the girls, especially, moved to Detroit, uh, somewhat around, I would, I would assume around the early 40s, they moved to Detroit, two of, the boy, uh, two of the girls especially. And they moved to Detroit because in Detroit they had better opportunities. It was, it was still somewhat slavery, uh, but not like it was in the South where somebody had his... Uh, knee on your neck all the time. They were fair enough. They could really pass for white. So they went to Detroit and they were uh, employed as elevator operators and summing clerks or whatever in stores in Detroit. Better opportunities in Detroit. Detroit. So after they, uh, my grandmother stayed in Greenville along with her sister Aunt Lily, who was very fair also, they stayed in Greenville and they found domestic kinds of jobs. And domestic jobs meant that they worked in cafeterias and they worked in, in uh, people's houses and so on. So my mother followed the same. In fact, I got my mother a, a job. 
I was walking to elementary school one day and and this lady uh, came to the door and said, uh, uh, <laughs> a nickel was a lot. My brother went to the store for a lady for a penny once. That was a lot of money at that time. But she said, do you know of anybody who would uh, like to work for me? I said, all right. I, I, I was in elementary school. I didn't know, but I went home and told my mother that this lady was looking for somebody to help her in her house. So my mother went, it was only down the street. So my mother went down there and she was employed by this woman and stayed employed until the lady died and until her husband died. She helped her raise her children and uh, they were all uh, there forever for each other. So I went off from elementary school, Sullivan Street Elementary School. I went off from there to uh, Sterling High School segregation still law of the land something happened and sterling high school was burned to the ground that was the mo uh back there you know if you didn't like white folks didn't like what was going on they burned the place down they burned my daddy's church down it was out in the country and uh on a piece of land that they somebody wanted i guess so they burned it down. So Sterling was torched in in uh, 19 and, uh, see I graduated in 1956. So Sterling was torched sometime after 1956, I believe. So after I graduated from high school, I had a scholarship. And we talk about uh, the Harris woman now going to uh, be the vice president and, and is a member of a sorority. The sorority gave me a scholarship. I'll never be vice president, of course, but <laughs> uh, the sorority gave me a $100 scholarship to go to college. And at that time, $100 was a lot of money to get a scholarship. My goodness. So I applied to... Uh, uh, South Carolina State, and my, my neighbor was going to Tennessee State, and I thought, well, Tennessee seems like far enough away from home for me to uh, enjoy, so I applied to Tennessee State, was accepted with my $100, and not a scholarship, but tuition at that time, when you talk about tuition at the University of California being, you know, $11,000 a year or more for a semester, uh, tuition at that time was about $600 a quarter, I believe. And if you made a perfect record, all A's in your coursework the year, the semester before, you got to go free. So I, every quarter, every quarter, I tried to make all A's. And I did sometimes. I'd make my mother very happy that she didn't have to scoff up the money for my tuition because I had all A's. And by the way, going to New York during the segregated times, we never heard of the Green Book. You know what the Green Book is? You never heard of it either. They made a movie about the Green Book. The Green Book was a, a book that told where uh, black people especially could spend the night or could have a meal or whatever. Because you could not, segregation was such you couldn't eat in a restaurant. You could not eat, uh, you could not sleep in a, in a hotel or whatever. So going to Tennessee uh, uh, State before I went to New York, going to Tennessee was a problem for my father in that he would have to drive over the Great Smokies. And the Great Smoky Mountains are nothing to play with. You have to be kind of alert to, to, you know, all those curves and whatever. And he would drive his cab all day long and, and try to take me to college in the afternoon or later overnight or whatever. And he did not hear of the Green Book either. We never heard of the Green Book. What in the world? I didn't know anything about the Green Book until they made a movie. In the Green Book, uh, it would have told him someplace he could have stayed along the way if he could have afforded it. 
but we could not afford that at that time. We could not afford. This is now uh, 19. We're going to Tennessee in 19. Graduate. We, we're going 1958. We're going to Tennessee. He could not afford. So uh, one night, <laughs> my mother nearly had a heart attack. He pulled off the road and she said, what are you doing, Richard? Have you lost your mind? He had pulled off in a cemetery. And he said, she was about ready to jump out of the car. But anyway, he, 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 he said, you'll be safe here. You don't have to worry because these people are not going to bother you. They're not alive. They're dead. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how we managed to get travel to Tennessee. But when I got the scholarship to New York, of course, they drove up. And I, I, I think they stayed with relatives when they came up to my graduation. And so that was history. But anyway, during that time, I went to tennis, I mean, went to uh, Teachers College, Columbia University, uh, two years. It was tough. It was tough. Coming from the segregated South, you know, I did not know how to handle big city living. Luckily, I lived in a dormitory, but still being taught by professors who had written their own textbooks and this kind of thing kept me up a many night. But I struggled. And I made it to the master's degree, had to do my thesis like everybody else, and I graduated. May 15th, 1962, uh, well, before May 15th, I had been looking for a job. I was going to graduate that year, 1962. I was going to graduate with a master's degree in business education. I was wondering where I was going to find a job, whether I was going to have to go back to Southern California, California not to California, but to uh, South Carolina, or I could find a job someplace else. So I heard that there was a job opening in Modesto for a business teacher in 1962. So I hurried up and I wrote a letter to uh, Mr. Barry, who was the principal at that time. I wrote him, detailed my qualifications, told him how, how much interest I had in the position, and so on. May 15th, I got a call from uh, Bob Colton, who was the vice president, who was the uh, well, vice principal, and Mr. Barry. They were both on the line. And... Uh, they questioned me about my qualifications and all that and so on. So they seemed interested. So Mr. Barry said, well, uh, uh, I said, I will come to California if you want me to come to California. I was just that desperate. It was May 15th. I was going to graduate like in the May. So Mr. Barry said, oh, no, you don't have to come to California. He said, uh, your qualifications are such that yeah, you can have the job if you want it. So I thought, that's mighty strange. Well, I didn't knock it because, after all, it would take a plane fare and whatever to come to California. And I had applied at San Francisco. I had applied to Sacramento and, and Los Angeles. And I didn't hear anything from these places. You get on a you had to get on a, uh, 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 what they call it, a wait list, so to speak, after you pass a test or whatever. So to tell me that I could have the job without coming to California, without interviewing or anything like that, I was wondering what was up. So I said, well, I'll just try it anyway. So I accepted the job and I decided I'll just have to pray over it and step out on faith. That's what I've always done. Even with Michael, I stepped out on faith to embrace Michael, and you see how Ma Michael has grown. So uh, after May 15th, I went home to South Carolina, and uh, we got together, and I decided uh, I'd, I'd move to California. 
Segregation was still the law of the land. And I wish you could have seen the, the train car uh, that we rode to California in. It was like a cattle car. Segregation was still the law of the land. We two days on this cattle car to, to Los Angeles. It was so rickety. No place to sleep. So we set up for two days right into California. And then we got to Los Angeles. We stayed with friends. And then from uh, Los Angeles, we came up to Modesto and spent the first night in the Covell Hotel. Well, they blew it up. They should have. <laughs> it, was, it was awful. It was awful. But it was a historic place. The Cavell Hotel. And the, we ate at the Hawk Bra that was close by. We made things very, very uh, uh, comfortable for ourselves close by. So the next day I thought, well, I better find out what's going on with this job and about the school and whatever. So we had uh, mutual friends, Mandy and Mel Williams. So they decided to take us around to show us the town of Modesto. So we got in the car, we drove, we drove past Modesto High School. And I said, oh, that's the place where I'm going to be teaching. I said, how many black uh, teachers do they have at that high school? Mandy said, you got to be kidding. <laughs> she said, they don't have any, and they've never had any. You are it. And, well, again, faith in myself. I didn't get frightened because of that. I thought this was really the reason why Bob Colton said he wanted to know why, if I wanted to come, maybe I should come to California so I could look them over as well as he could look me over, okay? No black teachers at Modesto High School. There were two other elementary black teachers in Modesto. Andre McDonald was one of them. I can't think of the name of the other person. So anyway, we, uh, uh, after I came off of that high of having, uh, knowing that I was the only black teacher I was going to be on view and, and, and all that. I didn't know what to expect, didn't know anything about anybody. But you know, uh, when you walk out on faith again, you just, you expect something good. Uh, Modesto High School, the principal and, and others, they had put a plan in place whereby Mary Ritter, she's been gone now, I'm sure, was my host teacher. She was to help me get uh, acclimated to Modesto and all that other stuff. It was wonderful the way they had, the support that they had given to me before I even got here. They had it all in place, had it all lined up. So uh, I found a place. Uh, on Pine Street, which was in walking distance of a school. And uh, from then on, it was history. I worked at Modesto High School, taught at Modesto High School for, uh, let's see, from 1962 to 1970. But during that time, let me tell you about the black folks here in Modesto. You think uh, the black folks in Modesto were different from the black folks in the South. There was not segregation here as a, as a means of the, of the land, of law of the land, but our kids had not been exposed to what other white kids had been exposed to. For example, in business, I was the advisor to the FBLA, Future Business Leaders of America. And I had a following of about five or six black girls who just, you know, always came around and I loved them and they loved me. And they had never had a scholarship, never been on the stage for a scholarship for anything at Modesto High School. So, and, 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 and hadn't even, a couple of them hadn't even thought about going to college. So I had to talk with them and I told them that, uh, you know, it was possible for them to, you know, get a scholarship like everybody else, apply. Just the encouragement, apply, apply. So uh, they applied, 
and they were shocked. I had five, four or five students on the stage for scholarship. Four or five, six or five or six went on to college. That was the year two of the Extended Opportunity and, and Services Program, EOPS. And they didn't realize that, you know, just a little bit of initiative could put them in college and, you know, a better future. So that was it. I got so much uh, uh, enthusiasm from them, got so much praise from their families, and so much praise from them too. I still see them really now. They're lovely, still around, they still call me. And I am very happy that I was in Modesto at that time. Now, how did I get to Modesto also? In addition to finding out there was a job at uh, Modesto High School, Reverend Clark was the uh, leader of the NAACP at that time. I guess he was the chairman. He was the pastor of Second Baptist Church, too. And he and others had been on the school board to apply, I mean, not necessarily to apply, but to appoint a black teacher at Modesto High. So when I came, everybody knew that I was from uh, out of town and that Reverend Clark was behind my coming. That was wonderful. They said, finally, we know, we know Reverend Clark managed to get a black teacher at Modesto High School. Well, I got a black, I got, I got the job myself, but still he was to be remembered for having put pressure on the board to provide a black teacher for students. I didn't have any problem with students there. I still see students who are, uh, uh, were from my class, just wonderful. I have yet, I have yet to have one student I had to call the principal on, uh, on, the, on the case. They were the most wonderful students that I've ever had. But in 1970, I went up to the junior college as a counselor and uh, as an EOPS counselor. And at that time, uh, Van Wagner was, the, was the, over the EOPS program. And that's when we started the college readiness program. It was a six-week program. They got paid for coming, and it was wonderful. We always had a big picnic at the end. It was just wonderful. We took them on field trips. It was it was an eye opening for students who had not seen that kind of action. So in that was in nineteen seventy, I came to the college. I worked in ELPS until Arnie Blank and and Dr. Zellis advertised a position uh, in community education. Uh, they wanted to expand the economic development side of the house. And they advertised the position, and check this out. It was only a one semester position. <laughs> one semester position. <laughs> Here you're talking about trying people out. That one, one semester position, and then it would rotate to the next position. So anyway, I applied. I was the first person to be in that position uh, for uh, the economic development. So after a few months with Becky Sharper as the, as the lead person, uh, Dudley Roach was in the uh, uh, community services office. He was put in the library. Dudley was put in the library. So Becky and I, ran community services and we watched it grow and to this very day other than the pandemic now which has kind of stifled everything the community services program has grown and grown and grown uh, with the michael program included and many many other programs included in that after the one semester as dr zealous wrote to uh, Dr. Ben Groningen, I think, and said uh, he didn't mean for it to be just one semester. <laughs> he meant for it to be a year. So they expanded it. I stayed in the position for the whole year, and the rest is history. I stayed in the community services until 
I retired in 2001. 1991, I was still working at the junior college, and I decided that since I was a part of the first leadership Modesto class in Modesto and had promised in writing that I would eventually do something for the betterment of Modesto, that it would be time for me to step out on faith again. So after five years, I decided to run for the school board in 1991. 1991 to 2007, I completed four terms on the school board. Coming in number one, the first time I ran, number one out of all the candidates who were running for the school board, number one. Thanks to Mike Lynch and Alan Cassidy, I came in number one. They spent many hours with me toying, trying to, working with the kitchen cabinet. That's what I call the people who helped me. They were in the kitchen cabinet. Uh, come in number one. So in 2007, I decided it was time to give it up. 2009, I believe, I ran, I mean, I was appointed to the Board of Regents for the University of California. I spent a many day reading. I can't see these days because of the reading those agendas. <laughs> Spent many hours working on different projects for the university. And, and I am so pleased that I can see how the university connects with the colleges and the, and the uh, high schools and so on. They do a fabulous job. So that is about the story of my life. I have done quite a few things. Uh, uh, this is only part one. And <laughs> one of these days we'll do part two. And uh, I want to appreciate the opportunity to, to have been a part of Black History Month because now it's settled how I got to address the one thing I did uh, forget how the difference was between driving in Modesto and driving in, in uh, South Carolina, even during segregation. We never had a train run on the same street as cars. And the first, ta first time I uh, was on the street, in the, on 9th Street, and met the train coming in my direction, I thought, oh wow, what am I in for now? <laughs> it was like the wild, wild west. <laughs> Didn't know whether to jump out, whether to run or whatever. But anyway, it's been a fabulous journey here in Modesto. I'll never forget it. it on my tombstone, I'd like to have this read. It's a, uh, to a woman whose life was well lived. Goodbye. <laughs>